you so much for joining us. In position to attack, Russia has 190,000 troops surrounding Ukraine. United States officials say President Putin has given the word to his field commanders, be ready to invade. Reports also indicate that Moscow has drawn up a kill list. Desperate diplomatic efforts are underway with French President Macron working over the weekend to set up a summit between Presidents Biden and Putin. Dale Hurd reports on the latest rumblings of war. U.S. and French officials say Presidents Biden and Putin have agreed to meet in principle. Now the Russians are saying that's premature. This as Russian forces are poised to attack. Russia Sunday extended its military drills in Belarus along Ukraine's northern border after two days of shelling in eastern Ukraine between Russian separatist and Ukrainian forces. CBN's George Thomas says Moscow-backed forces in the east are laying the groundwork for a pretext to invade. Russia's eight-year-long war against Ukraine in the east has taken a dramatic turn in the last 72 hours. Three sources that I've spoken to in the occupied territories say that they've been notified this weekend that women, children and the elderly need to evacuate immediately because they allege that Ukraine is preparing for a massive military offensive. In addition, men between the ages of 18 and 60 are ordered to stay behind and to take up arms. Moscow has as many as 190,000 troops surrounding Ukraine, at least half of them in attack positions. Former U.S. Ambassador to Ukraine William Taylor describes Ukraine as a hostage in a struggle between Russia and the West. Ukraine has a gun to its head while the Russians are negotiating with the Americans and NATO and others. And, and so, yes, they are, they are upon them. Ukrainian President Zelensky at a conference in Munich, Germany, asked why the West has taken so long to impose sanctions on Russia. We don't need your sanctions after the bombardment will happen. Secretary of State Antony Blinken told CNN because once sanctions are invoked, Vladimir Putin has nothing left to lose. The purpose of the sanctions in the first instance is to try to deter Russia from going to war. As soon as you trigger them, that deterrent is gone. Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin says Russia has amassed enough firepower to take the Ukrainian capital, Kyiv, but with mass civilian casualties. If he employs that kind of combat power, it will certainly create uh, enormous casualties, uh, you know, within a civilian population. Across Ukraine, civilians are taking part in combat training, preparing to fight if necessary. In the meantime, the U.S. says Moscow has drawn up a kill list, targeting Russian dissidents, journalists, human rights activists, and ethnic and religious minorities living in Ukraine. Dale Hurd, CBN News. We'll certainly pray for the peace of Ukraine, and uh, my, my heart goes out to everyone there. They obviously feel like they're a pawn in a much larger game. Russia seems to have backed itself into a corner, and uh, will they actually withdraw from the brink of war? Let us hope so. Let's hope this latest uh, round of peace talks can actually produce peace. Uh, but again, my, my prediction is they'll, they'll try to an annex those two rogue provinces on the eastern side of, of the country, and that's, that's sort of the end game, if you will, for Russia. They'll declare victory, uh, and then, then we'll all move on. But the, the Europe is never going to forget this. And I think one of the unintended consequences for Russia is a renewed and re reinvigorated NATO. In other news, a transgender college athlete dominated a woman's swimming competition over the weekend. John Jessup has more on that story from our CBN News Bureau in Washington. John? That's right, Gordon. Leah Thomas, formerly a male swimmer for the University of Pennsylvania, won three individual events in the Ivy League Women's Championships, breaking several records along the way. As senior national affairs correspondent Heather Sells reports, Thomas's case provides an example of why some believe transgender athletes pose a threat to women's sports. As a male athlete, Will Thomas ranked 462 in the NCAA over three seasons on the University of Pennsylvania swim team. Now, competing as a female, Leah Thomas has set multiple program records, ranks number one, 
and has qualified for the NCAA championships in March. I love to compete and I just love to see how fast I can go. 16 of Thomas's teammates at the University of Pennsylvania are protesting. They're saying Thomas holds an unfair advantage and should not be allowed to compete against women. Joining them, a few veterans of the swim community, like 30-year referee Cynthia Millen, who has resigned over the situation. No matter how much testosterone suppression drugs Leah may take, Leah will always be swimming in a man's body. And this is just blatantly unfair. Men will always swim 8 to 12 percent faster than women. They have larger lung capacity. They have larger skeleton. The NCAA, however, has ruled Thomas can compete in the championships, refusing to adopt a new USA swimming rule that requires three years of suppressed testosterone that would have disqualified Thomas. Thomas began hormone therapy in May of 2019. I do think that the consequence of allowing Leah to compete at the NCAA championships compromises more than one individual, uh, the person that comes second to, to Leah. It's the person who doesn't advance into the final eight because Leah is in competition. It's the athlete that, uh, who doesn't advance to the top 16. Uh, which is also a point scoring position. The trans athlete debate appears to be picking up steam as these real life consequences sink in. South Dakota is now the 10th state with a law officially protecting female athletes. Governor Kristi Noem says it's about Title IX and women's rights. Now there's many different um, competitions where biological sex isn't that big of a deal and we don't make accommodations for it in debate competitions or academic right. uh, speech competitions, but in athletics, it does matter. It's really just taking a toll on just people's love for the sport in general. And more female athletes are speaking out. Iowa high school track star Ainsley Erzin is headed for the University of Arkansas and wrote an op-ed in the Des Moines Register, calling on state officials to protect girls' sports. Unfortunately, if we allow more trans athletes to compete in women's sports, um, that puts that puts the results way out of um, female athletes' control. For now, all eyes remain on Thomas, who after dominating the women's 200 and 500 freestyle this season, will compete in next month's NCAA championships. Heather Sells, CBN News. All right, thank you, Heather. Well, today is President's Day, the national holiday honoring U.S. presidents. Along those lines, a new documentary highlights the spiritual life of America's first president and a man known as the father of the country. CBN's Jenna Browder tells us more. As we celebrate President's Day, a new inspirational documentary is shedding light on the extraordinary life of George Washington. And unlike others, this one dives deep into his faith. When we look at George Washington, we're clearly looking at the great icon of our country, the United States. George Washington won in a seven-part documentary series produced by the Providence Forum. A man who has given his name to our capital city. He was called the father of this country in his own lifetime. He has been called by historians the indispensable man. They look to Washington as a general. Author and executive director Jerry Newcomb. The purpose of this this series, which is called the Foundation of American Liberty series. And if anybody asks me, well, what's the foundation of American liberty? It's our Judeo-Christian heritage. It's the fact that our founders said that our rights come from the creator. And that has been the source of America's greatness. And George Washington, as a man, was indispensable in helping create America. George Washington really was that prank. Our first commander in chief who led a ragtag army of farmers and merchants to defeat the strongest military in the world. And when he had the chance to rule, he pushed power away, refusing to be king. This particular example was one of, of, of a handful, which were very important examples of George Washington choosing the Christian type of, of uh, leadership, servant leadership. And Nuko Mads, God placed his hand on Washington early in life. In 1755, when he was a young man in his 20s, and he was an American officer in the British Army during the uh, French and Indian War. And there was a massacre that occurred in which all the officers 
on the American and the British side were killed except one, and that was George Washington. And it wasn't because they didn't try. They actually tried. They even aimed their guns at him. And uh, by God's grace, he was spared. He had uh, horses shot out from under him. He had four bullet holes in his cloak. He had to actually write his brother, John Augustine, and send a letter saying, you may have heard that I died. I didn't, by God's grace. There's no doubt Washington had God's favor. This documentary highlights that and the ways God was with Washington as a man and as he became the great leader we now celebrate today. In Washington, Jenna Browder, CBN News. Thank you, Jenna. And for more information on how to watch the documentary, simply go to our website, cbnnews.com. Gordon? Uh, literally, you can't say enough good things about George Washington, the father of our country. Um, he's noted as a man of prayer, and his uh, writings are, are filled with this wonderful word for providence. He, he would look to providence. He was trying to um, be ecumenical in a time where it wasn't really possible or even, even permitted. But his letter to a Rhode Island synagogue goes down in history as one of the great letters extolling religious tolerance in the, the new nation, America. His uh, command of generals and then the inspiration he gave them. And this is a rarely understood part of American history. The uh, colonial ar army, the Revolutionary Army, uh, they took an oath, uh, and they called themselves the Order of Cincinnatus, that they were not interested in any position in the upcoming government, that their whole aim, once they won the war, is to be like Cincinnatus, who was a hero from the Roman Empire, that when he defeated the enemy, he didn't take the laurels, he didn't take any money for his, for his victory, he didn't take any position in the Roman Senate, what did he do? He went back home and started farming again. Uh, that's what the legacy of George Washington is. It's an incredible legacy. When King George heard that he refused the crown, he did not want to be king of America, and he had to be talked into being president, when he heard that, he just remarked, what an incredible man. Uh, let's honor his legacy. Let's honor the father of our country. Terry? Any chance we can resurrect the order? <laughs> it still exists. It's still, really? Yeah, the, uh, the descendants of all those generals and the officers wow. in the Revolutionary Army, uh, they still have a place in Washington, D.C., and they still celebrate the memory. Remarkable. 200 unmarked graves. They were discovered last year in Canada at an Indian boarding school. The discovery prompted the United States Secretary of the Interior to launch a national investigation. Mark Martin traveled to Montana to explore this tragedy that's become an issue on both sides of the border. When he was a child, Blackfeet Nation member Wes Bremner attended the Cutbank Boarding School in northwestern Montana. As a second grader in the 60s, distance and harsh winters made it a necessity. The school environment proved harsh as well. Bremner says physical abuse started on day one when a staff member punched him. He thumped me right between the eyes and almost knocked me out. And I went against the wall, just kind of wobbly on my feet. And uh, he said, now you go to bed. And it was about this time of day. Brimner is just one of many students who say they endured harsh corporal punishment and demeaning verbal abuse at indigenous boarding schools. And some came forward years later with allegations of sexual abuse. We asked Brimner if that ever happened to him. If I was, I would take it to my grave. And why is that again? It's the past. It's not something you would, uh, It's nobody's business. The boarding school where Bremner attended is still operational today. He says it's better run, and the abuse that took place when he was a student is unheard of. On the Flathead Reservation in Montana, indigenous boarding schools existed alongside St. Ignatius Mission. The Jesuit priest and pastor, Father Craig Hightower, says abuse happened at these schools as well. 
there was some sexual abuse. There's no question about it. Um, and that's already been litigated in court. Uh, the majority of the abuses were uh, trying to take away their culture, uh, trying to assimilate them into the white world, uh, and the corporal punishment of the day. The, I mean, just the corporal punishment that was common at that time. All that is left of the original Ursuline Academy are the remains of this grotto that held a statue of Mary. Children ages preschool to high school gathered in a building that once stood on this property. Was it worse with the priests and the nuns? Maybe, maybe not, but that, those were the big controversies of, uh, of kids you know, really being be beaten and things like that. Uh, unfortunately, that was part of the culture overall. According to the National Native American Boarding School Healing Coalition, more than 350 U.S. government-funded and many times church-run boarding schools operated in the 19th and 20th centuries. The movement started under the Indian Civilization Act of 1819 with the goal of assimilating indigenous children. Bremner says his mother was one of thousands of kids taken from their communities. He says at her school there was a sign that read, kill the culture, save the child. Montana State Representative Sharon Stewart Paragoy says while Crow tribe children weren't forcibly taken, the goal remained the same. Children weren't allowed to speak the language. Um, that was, and um, part of it was the hair was cut especially with the boys uh, and the girls, their, their hair was cut, and then they were forced to move into the, the modern dress. The 2021 discovery of more than 200 unmarked graves at an Indian boarding school in Canada led Deb Holland, the U.S. Secretary of the Interior, to launch a national investigation, the Federal Indian Boarding School Initiative. Holland, the first Native American cabinet secretary, says her eight-year-old grandparents were taken from their families. She hopes the investigation will shed light on the unspoken traumas of the past. A lot of them died. Some of them probably died from broken hearts, and a lot of them just died from being in close contact with disease that they couldn't get rid of because everybody was crammed in together. And so what we want for our children is to help them to get to reconnect to who they are and to be strong. And, and to have thriving nations. That's what we hope um, Deb Howland will be able to do, is to change the policy, educational policy, to provide empowerment. It's no strange thing for Native American communities not to trust the government, but um, to, to be able to create and to heal bonds within Native American communities and county governments, state governments, and the federal government and um, to have that conversation so that we can move forward. Mark Martin, CBN News, Montana. Well, we need to have the conversation. We need to have the conversation, not, in Can not just in Canada, not just in the United States, but you look at Australia and what they did to the Aboriginal culture there. It's all the same, where children were taken from their families, put into boarding schools, and the whole idea was to break their culture. Uh, the whole idea was, uh, you know, we're, we're going to give you the benefits, if you will, of uh, civilization. And, and it's wonderful to let's turn this around to say, no, this isn't the proper function of government. The proper function of government is to let people live in liberty and live in freedom and to help them in whatever way you can provide for a common defense, provide for free commerce uh, and but for the rest of it. Please get out of the way. Uh, I think all Americans can say when somebody from the government shows up saying we're, we're here to help you, uh, we say, no, you're not. Uh, you're, you're, you're not in any position to help us because you have no idea what we're going through uh, or our own plans to succeed might actually be better than yours. Uh, so it's wonderful to have this conversation. It's wonderful to look at our past and say, never again. Let us never, ever do this kind of thing. Terry? Growing up, Christine Darden had a passion for math and a knack for physics. Still, she never dreamed she'd wind up working for NASA. Yet, that's exactly what happened. And not only did her career soar, Christine blazed a trail of opportunity for others. Russia orbits Sputnik 1, the Earth's first man-made satellite. The year is 1957. Russia had just launched into space Sputnik. It came as a shock to many Americans, including a 16-year-old named Christine Darden. 
Soviet fires Earth satellite into space. It has circled the globe at 18,000 miles an hour. We were afraid that the Russians were flying over us and might drop a bomb. Although afraid of war like many at the time, Christine, a high school senior, had no interest in being a part of America's space race. Her dream was to be a mathematician. At the same time I realized that math was a passion, I also realized how much I enjoyed physical science. And, and that led on to the physics also. As a child, her inquisitive nature had her dismantling a doll her mother had given her. Well, the doll talked. What's inside that doll that's making it talk? By the time she was attending Hampton University, Christine was undaunted as a student. Taking six math classes at one time, she was often the only woman in a classroom full of men. Her faith and determination pushed her forward. Things in the Bible helped me live the life and, and believe that God can help me do certain things and work with me in, in certain ways. Well, how can I take six math courses? As she worked to complete a degree in mathematics, her father encouraged her to get a teaching certificate. Because dad thought I wouldn't get a job otherwise. I think my mind turned to people are not hiring African-American mathematicians, maybe because African-Americans weren't becoming mathematicians. With some notable exceptions, including three African-American women who were mathematicians working across town at NASA. They had not only broken the racial barrier, they had helped put a man in space. And Katherine Johnson's daughter was my classmate there. One of the hidden figures depicted in the movie based on Margot Lee Shetterly's book, Katherine Johnson also helped put a man on the moon. Still, Christine hadn't considered she could one day work at NASA. So she graduated and began teaching mathematics. And the students tell me when I talk that they can hear the passion in my voice. She didn't stay in one place long. Her love for numbers had her driving 80 miles on the weekends to Petersburg to take upper level math courses at Virginia State University. It was there that her hard work and talent were recognized. She was hired as a research assistant for the head of the physics department. Now married, Christine and her husband Walter, who was pursuing his own career, began working on their master's degrees. I was headed toward graduation. I went by the placement office at Virginia State. A chance meeting with a woman who worked in the placement office would propel her into a profession she had never considered. I don't think I had thought about that. It just, I hadn't even thought about NASA being here. She said, where have you been? Didn't you know NASA was here recruiting yesterday? You fill out this application, I'm going to mail it in tomorrow. I want this back in the morning. And she sent it in, and two and a half weeks later, I had an offer from NASA. Christine was among the last of the so-called human computers or data analysts to be hired at NASA. It didn't take long before she wanted to do more. I brought up the issue of why is the male with the math degree doing the engineering and the female with the math degree drawing a curve, which is what I was doing at first. And that was when I went to the director and said, why is it that you're not treating the same backgrounds with the same kinds of jobs? You're giving people who have pretty much the same background, but you're giving them vastly different jobs. I left his office and that was when I got promoted. I got transferred. Now an aerospace engineer, Christine became an internationally known expert in high-speed aerodynamics and sonic booms, specifically by writing a computer program on sonic boom minimization. When a plane is flying supersonically, a conical form shapes on the nose of the airplane. And all of the disturbances, shocks coming off the airplane, the molecules that get pushed out of the way and everything, all stop at the edge of this cone. She also became the first African-American woman to be promoted to the senior executive service. During her 40 years at NASA, she's been recognized for many awards and honors, including being written about as the fourth hidden figure. At 78 years old and ever learning, Christine continues to work on math problems. Wonder what else we can do in this world with math that hasn't been done.
What a remarkable woman. I mean, you can see it in her eyes, can't you? She's still learning and always going to be learning and probably always paving the way for others. But uh, a life that has touched uh, not only industry, but also also people, individual people with gifts and talents. And we salute her. Christine Darden, tremendous. Welcome back to Washington for the CBN News Break. Buckingham Palace reports Queen Elizabeth has COVID. The 95-year-old monarch is experiencing mild symptoms, but continues to carry out light duties during the day. British Prime Minister Boris Johnson is set to lift all COVID restrictions in England today. While here at home, cases and hospitalizations continue to fall, signaling that the Omicron, Omicron rather, is losing its grip. Many cities and states are starting to roll back. COVID restrictions. Well, during the 2021 Christmas season, CBN's Croatia Superbook team hosted several parties for children and their families. The Superbook team gave gifts to the children, played games, and watched episodes of the animated series together. The events in different cities across Croatia even included visits from the popular character Gizmo. One child shared how Superbook affected her life, saying, quote, every morning I would get up around 6 or 7 a.m., and watch at least one episode. You can find out more about what CBN is doing around the world by going to cbn.com slash international. Del Anderson's cardiologist told her that she should be dead. 90% of people with her kind of heart attack never make it to the hospital. To Del, today, well, Del isn't just alive, she's feeling better than ever. Here's how a life-saving promise led to a miracle. And she said these words that would just forever change my life. She said, you will live and not die. As the band began to start the worship music, I stood and I raised my hand in, in worship. And a woman that I didn't know, I had never seen her before, she walked past me, turned around, and came back and stood nose to nose with me. She said, fear not, for the Lord your God says you will surely live and not die. I think both of us were a little concerned. Obviously, you'll live and not die. Uh, it kind of tells you something is going to happen soon. So both of us were quite concerned and just kind of, OK, what's going to happen next? Monday came. I just didn't feel quite right. I just felt kind of out of sorts, tired and not feeling my best. I was sitting on my sofa with my husband and something's not right. I can't breathe. I said, I need to go to the hospital. We took her immediately to the emergency room, pulled up. They came out with a wheelchair, wheeled her inside. The whole time, I'm saying to God, have your hand on her. My vitals are are slipping and I'm saying, Lord, forgive me for everything I've ever done, anything, Lord, that's not pleasing to you. And I saw our pastor lean down and whisper, remember, Dale, you shall live and not die. They came back and they said, you've had a heart attack and it looks like a bad one. And she's going to have to have a stent put in. They did the stent, and the cardiologist said, you should be dead right now. 90% of the people who have the kind of heart attack you've had uh, don't even make it to the hospital, or they die in their sleep at night. The heart attack was so bad that it severely damaged my heart. My heart was functioning at only about 20%. They were so worried that I could have another heart event, that they fitted me with a life vest. Uh, it's actually a defibrillator that they strap around you with all kind of monitoring uh, devices on it. Coming back to the house was tough. The only way to get her around was in a wheelchair. I had to pretty much just kind of take over whatever was needed. He would not leave my side. And when we got home, every night, every night, he served me communion and pray. I couldn't breathe. I couldn't bend over. I couldn't do anything. All I could do is just get up and go to the bathroom and go back 
and lay right back down because I was terribly, terribly, terribly weak. With the amount of damage that I had in my heart, they told me, you need to get used to this life because your life as you have known it is never gonna be the same. My daughter had a friend that came over to visit with me. He had um, gone to seminary under this well-known pastor and he called him. He said, we have a friend and she's had a heart attack and her heart is severely damaged. She's very weak and she needs a miracle. And this man said, have her at my church Sunday morning at 930 because God is going to heal her. You know, I mean, we had to wheel her in. She was so weak. And then lifting her up, uh, two people on each side of her lifting her up. They lifted me out of the wheelchair and I stood there in front of him. And when he put his hand on the top of my head, it felt like a bolt of electricity just shot through my body. And when it did, it set off the siren on my defibrillator. I mean, the, the noises and the bells and whistles, everything's happening, you know, and I'm thinking, what is gonna go happen now? And she was able to get around there and cut it off before the thing, you know, went off. It, it hit me right then that something special was going on here. The very next day, I had a preset appointment for a follow-up with my cardiologist. No wheelchair. And he looks at me and he says, how are you doing? I said, I'm, I'm doing great. And I said, but I don't like this life vest on. I want to take it off. He said, oh no, you can't take off the life vest. And I said, I want another test. I want to prove to you that God healed me. After the test, he said, take that defibrillator off because you don't need it anymore. Your heart is back to normal. He said, you've had a miracle. My heart was back to normal, but it was the low end of normal. So this young man calls that pastor back again. And he said, you have her back here Sunday morning. God's going to finish what he started. We wound up going back in and kicking it up a notch. <laughs> he touched her and uh, I could tell God healed her. Then we went back to the doctor. He said these words after the test. Dale, not only is your heart back to normal, your heart is at the high end of normal. The Lord had given me a brand new heart, a brand new heart. I feel better now than I did 20 years ago. I have more strength. I feel healthier than I ever did. Keep walking and keep believing and hoping and praying and hanging on to God. And sure enough, he, he came through. There is nothing that he can't do. There is nothing that he can't do. Think this thought, and it's a wonderful thought. How big is possible? It's a great thought to think, especially when you're getting ready to pray. How big is possible? For with God, all things are possible. Now, Dell held, held on to a prophetic word. Here's something very unusual, where someone from the worship team actually comes down from the um, podium from the front of the church and, and says, you shall not die, but live. What they were doing was quoting Psalm 118. And I encourage anyone who has gotten a diagnosis to claim this one. It's a wonderful verse. I shall not die, but live and declare the glory of the Lord. It's the psalm that Jesus sang at the end of the Last Supper. It was a Seder service. Psalm 118 concludes every Seder service. And if Jesus can sing it while he's facing the cross, he knows the resurrection is coming. I shall not die, but live and declare the glory of the Lord. This is the day the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. 
I will declare his glory in the assembly. I will declare it to the nations. I love this. This is wonderful. What happened to Dell, it can happen to you. Just believe that all things are possible. Just believe how big is possible, how big is God, how great is his power towards us who believe. Now, we're going to pray for you. Before we pray, we want to encourage you with some other people that have had miracles. Here's Sarah. She sent in an email and said, I suffered from a pain that started on my upper left leg, shot down to my knee. For eight years, doctors could not figure out what was causing the pain. I was not able to sleep on my left side. Well, Terry, on one of the programs, that someone had shooting pain down the left leg to place my hand on it and accept healing. She said, God is healing that for you right now, and that pain will never return. Well, I claim that healing. I am healed. Just last night, I found myself sleeping on the left side, and I'm amazed that my leg no longer hurts. Eight wow. years now That's healed. That's amazing. This is Angela. She wrote by email and said, on February 11th this year, Gordon had a word for someone named Angela who's dealing with neuropathy. That word was for me. I am now cancer free, but chemo left me with severe neuropathy. At one point, it was severe, severe enough to require use of a cane. As someone whose work requires a lot of typing, it has been crippling. During Gordon's word, my fingers and feet began tingling and haven't stopped. This is a good sign, and I claim my healing. We claim it too, Angela. Right. God bless you. That's awesome. Claim your healing. Claim your he healing. Here's a word for you. It's from Psalms 2, Psalm 103. Bless the Lord, O my soul. Bless him. You know, declare this is the day the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. Bless the Lord, O my soul, who forgives all your iniquities, who heals all your diseases. That's a wonderful word. Let's claim it right now and claim the impossible for you. Let's pray. Lord, we come to you. We come to you believing. We come to you and, and just accept all the benefits that you've provided for us. We accept the forgiveness that you so freely give us, that you cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You set us free from the law of sin and death. We, we receive that from you right now. And now we come boldly to the throne of grace, and we ask that you would stretch forth your hand to heal our disease, that people would be perfectly whole, there would be no more cancer, no more neuropathy, no more blinding headache, no more problems with joints, no more arthritis. We claim it all now for them. You heal all our diseases now in Jesus' name. Uh, there's a man, your name is Thomas, and you have an enlarged liver. I, I think there's a tumor on one of the lower lobes of your, your liver. God is healing you of that. He is restoring you. He's able to dissolve tumors and completely remove them from your body. Receive it now in Jesus' name. Be healed and be made whole. Terry? Yeah, there's someone else. You have core issues as well with your, your it's not your extremities, it's, but it's multiple. And you think, if God healed one, I still would have all these others. Today, God is healing you completely. Every single diagnosis you have now, today, has been answered by the power and the mercy and the love of Jesus Christ. Just receive that. Um, there's someone you've had a fall, and the word I'm getting is your, your, your pelvic girdle, and, and it's, it's been separated. Um, it's, it's like you, uh, it, it's not a normal position. It's, it's spread out. God is healing that. He's restoring it to you right now. He's bringing things together. That incredible pain you've been suffering with is now gone in Jesus' name. You're able to walk and walk freely. You're able even to run. In Jesus' name, be healed and be made whole. 
Yeah, someone else, you have a rash that persists on both of your hands, on the inside palm part of your hand, so it's very uncomfortable when you're touching anything. Uh, I don't think it's eczema. I really don't know what it is, but God is healing that for you today. It's just going to begin to heal over, and you'll not have it again in Jesus' name. Uh, someone, you got shooting pains down from the top, outside of your left shoulder, down your left arm. Uh, you've already been tested. Is it a heart condition? That came back negative. There's something internal with that shoulder joint, particularly with the nerve that's irritating it. God is healing you right now. He's restoring it. All that numbness, that inability to move, that is now gone in Jesus' name. Just receive it. Do what you couldn't do before. Lift that hand all the way up. Realize God has healed you, set you free from it in Jesus' name. Yeah, and someone else, you have a problem at the base of your brain stem. It's like it's out of position somehow. You get terrible migraine headaches and even back pain from it. God is just pulling that back into position for you right now, creatively putting you back together in Jesus' name. Be made whole. Lord, we thank you. We thank you for the miracles that you do, for you are the same yesterday, today, and forever. When we're faithless, you remain faithful. You cannot deny yourself. Thank you for everything you do for us. We receive it all in Jesus' name. Amen. amen and amen. amen. If you've been healed, let us know. Give us a call, 1-800-700-7000. If you need prayer, we're here for you. We're here for you 24 hours a day. We believe in prevailing prayer, that wonderful miracle story we just saw. She wasn't completely healed. She got on the low end of normal. She said, no, nah, I want the high end of normal. So she went back and got more prayer. We're here for you. Call us, 1-800-700-7000. Terry? Danny and his family lost their home twice, first because of a typhoon and second because of COVID-19. The family had nowhere else to go until Operation Blessing built them a new house. In the middle of the COVID-19 pandemic, Danny and his family were about to lose their home in the Philippines. The place that we live in doesn't belong to us. The owner just allowed us to live here in exchange for taking care of the land. Danny's family started living there after a Category 5 typhoon destroyed their home, livelihood, and belongings. The owner once asked us to leave this place, so we went to Mindanao. Life was harder there. I couldn't find a job. While visiting the area, we also met Susan. She's a single mom who was also displaced by the typhoon. She and her children have been living in a squatter's camp. We're now forced to leave this area. But the thing is, we have nowhere else to go to. It's so difficult. How can we get materials to build a new house? I'm just trying my best to look for another place. When we learned about Danny and Susan, we built them new houses in Operation Blessings Community of Hope in the Philippines. We recently built houses there for eight other families as well. I'm crying tears of joy because I'm happy because of God's grace and the help of Operation Blessing. My heart is so grateful because now we have a home. I am so thankful God gave us a house through Operation Blessing. I give all the glory to God because I know He is the one who made all of this possible. Community of hope. I love that. It's what Operation Blessing is all about, bringing hope into the midst of dire situations, giving people an opportunity to move ahead, to move on, to continue on with hope in their hearts and with a brand new beginning. If you're a 700 Club member, you make that happen. If you're not a 700 Club member, what an opportunity you are missing out on. And it's so simple. 65 cents a day, $20 a month makes you a 700 Club member. Even the number to call and join is toll free. It couldn't be easier. There are lots of levels you can join at. Maybe you're already a 700 Club member. You're giving that gift of $20 a month. Why don't you hop up to the 700 Club Gold level at $40 a month or become a 1,000 Club member at $84 a month. You can't believe the difference it makes when you just move up to the next level or when you just join. So if you haven't joined yet, this is the day to do it. Call our
our toll-free number, 1-800-700-7000. Just say, I want to join the 700 Club. Our way of saying thank you to you for caring about other people is to send you Pat's latest book, Hot Off the Press, The Power of the Holy Spirit in You. And you want to read this book, Understanding the Miraculous Power of God and how that can be a reality in your own life and situation. So call now. Change somebody else's life. Bring hope to communities that are suffering and many, many other things that Operation Blessing does. And we'll send this out to you right away. And we say thank you to you in advance. Time for some email. You All ready? Right. Okay, the first one is from Leona Gordon, who says, I've been told the Bible can't be trusted as legit because the translators misinterpreted the original texts. How can one truly trust the Bible we now have? Well, Leona, all the translations agree on this. Jesus rose from the dead. Uh, so you can find universal agreement. It doesn't matter what translation you're reading. Uh, the basic facts of the good news. Jesus came to earth. He lived the sinless life. He performed numerous miracles. He, he proved to everyone that he was the Messiah foretold by the prophets. He died on a cross as predicted by Scripture, and then as predicted by Scripture, he rose again from the grave. So the fundamentals, regardless of translation, are all the same. Now, you can get into nuances, and particular translations have definitely got it wrong. I always like to point out Jerome, when he translated from Greek and Hebrew to the Latin Vulgate, he used a particular Latin word, penitentia, instead of, for the Greek word, metanous. Metanous means change your thinking, change your mind, change your outlook on life. Uh, and believe the good news. And he, he translated it, have sorrow for your sin. And so it, that, that created a whole uh, line of doctrine, if you will. Um, in the Renaissance, the cry of the church was, let's go back to the original documents. Uh, let's do that. And then Martin Luther reading Romans in the original Greek, he had his great revelation by faith alone. Uh, and that changed the church. So if you have uh, issues with translations, get one of these wonderful inter interlineal Bibles where you can actually read it. You don't have to learn Greek or Hebrew, but you can have a dictionary with you. You can learn all the different meanings of the particular words from the original manuscripts, and you can solve all of these problems for yourself and get proof in the original manuscripts what they thought and what they intended as the gospel going forth. Here's a quick one from Debbie. I think I heard that the people that have died can't keep in touch with us on earth. If I pray to God to give my parents a message from me, would Jesus give them that message? <laughs> Jesus can do whatever he wants. So if you want to give a message to him, go ahead. But the Bible is quite clear. Don't communicate with the dead. Uh, so you, you're using Jesus as an intermediary. Fine, he can, he can obviously communicate with whoever he wants to communicate. But I would encourage you, um, stop dwelling on that. Get his words for what you should do now. Ask, and he will give it to you. And I'll leave with this word. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be open to you.